Well, we're going to get started here with our next session. We're going to have Dr. Chafee from Answers in Genesis come and present. Not doctor, excuse me. Mr. Chafee present from Answers in Genesis on the sons of God in Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. I'm going to take a moment here to introduce him. Dr. Excuse me, Mr. Shafee is works at Answers in Genesis. He's a writer there. As he mentioned earlier, he does a lot of the writing there for the museum, but also does a lot of other things. I've seen him online uh, doing a lot of question and answer, especially for us younger millennials that I fall into that category. So I highly recommend his material. If you've got people, young people that are looking for answers to questions, he just does a great job doing that. And one of the reasons why uh, my dad's having me introduce uh, Mr. Chafee is because a few months ago I moved uh, to an area right outside of St. Louis on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. And they were just showing me around the area. I've been there about four months. We went downtown to a city called um, Alton and they had this huge statue there of the world's tallest man or at the time recorded, he was 11 feet, I'm sorry, Eight feet, 11 inches, one inch shy from nine feet. And then, you know, I talked to my dad a few days later, and I said, yeah, I saw this statue. And he said, was it in Alton, Illinois? I'm like, how do you know that? He said, well, I was reading this book, and there's a picture of that, and it was Mr. Shafee's book, Topic of the Nephilim. So I'm looking forward to hearing his presentation. Let's welcome him as he shares with us this morning. All right, good morning. What a privilege it is for me to be here. And I got a little bit nervous, Dr. Ice, when you went around the room and had everybody introduce themselves because I thought, I read that guy's book. I've read that guy's book. I've known about his work for 20 years, and now I've got to give a presentation in front of all these guys. It would have been easier to do that later. But, um, but I appreciate it. Why did you write the book? Tell them why you wrote the book. Why did I write this one? Well, there are so many uh, books out there on this topic, on Genesis 6, the sons of God and the Nephilim. There are so many uh, websites out there about this topic, and very few of them do a real serious biblical study on this topic. And uh, there's, a, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, back in 2011, when I was completing my THM uh, from Liberty, uh, I had to do my thesis, and I decided to pick this topic. You might be able to guess why I have an interest in this topic. Um, I have been called uh, Nephilim so many times, and people don't even understand that that word is plural, so they're really calling me giant, not giant. They don't even know. Uh, but yeah, I've been called that many times. In fact, uh, where I work, Ken Ham calls me Neffel Tim. Um, but that's his nickname for me. But uh, as I get started, let me real uh, just up front state that as a ministry, Answers in Genesis doesn't take an official position on this topic. So what I'm going to be presenting today are my own views, not a representative of the ministry. It's just one of those uh, issue, those topics where we have a a non-position position. position. Uh, same thing would be true with the different millennial views and end times views or, or answers in Genesis, not answers in Revelation is how I kind of jokingly say it. Uh, so j with those disclaimers out of the way, uh, let me get into this topic. So yeah, this uh, book, Fallen, is nearly 500 pages on this topic, so I'm gonna cram that into one hour. Um, I can do this one of two ways. I can skip over a lot of stuff or I can talk really fast. Which one would you prefer? Uh, so we'll talk fast. <laughs> All right, well, I've got some other resources out there on the table as well. In fact, the last topic that we heard, uh, one of the books I've written, my first book, was called Old Earth Creationism on Trial. And if you're interested in that topic, in a, a, a respectful critique of the arguments used by Christians who believe in the billions of years and a local flood rather than what the Bible teaches, a young earth and a worldwide flood. Well, with that being said, uh, let's jump into this topic. In Genesis 6, it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took for themselves wives from any they chose. And Yahweh said, my spirit will not remain with man indefinitely, in that he is flesh. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, whenever the sons of God went into the daughters of men who bore to them children, they were the mighty men of antiquity, men of renown. Now, if you look in different biblical commentaries on this passage, 
uh, you will see a lot of different ideas that are put forth. In fact, some of them will just kind of gloss over it very quickly. They don't want to deal with it. Uh, if you look online and you look at different websites devoted to it, you're going to see all sorts of wild and crazy ideas. One of the reasons Dr. Ice wants me to present on this is so that he doesn't have to talk about the wild and crazy ideas and we'll let somebody else do it. No, it's, it's to correct a lot of those different ideas that are out there and to have a serious discussion on the topic. Uh, one thing you'll notice at the, at the very top line there, uh, instead of using the term the Lord that you'll see in a lot of Bibles where they're using small caps, Throughout this presentation, I'm putting that as Yahweh, which of course is God's personal name. And I'm, I do that for a very specific reason that you'll see as we go along. I want you to understand that when the Bible uses that term, it's not just giving a title to God, it's using his personal name in it. And you'll see why that's important as we go along here. But there are many key terms to address in this passage. Who were the daughters of men? Who were the sons of God? Uh, what does it mean that they took wives? And I just mentioned Yahweh there. Uh, what about the 120 years? What does that have to do with this passage? Why is that stuck there in verse 3? Uh, who were the Nephilim? And what about the mighty men? Who were they? And that word translated as when, or as what you saw in my translation there, whenever. Does that really matter one way or the other? You'll see that it makes a very big difference. So how do people usually interpret this passage? Well, within the church, there are three major views that have been held throughout church history. Uh, the Sethite view, this one was dominant from the time of Augustine in the early 5th century up until about 1900. And this view says that the, the sons of God were the godly line of Seth from Adam to Seth and then all the way down to Noah, while the daughters of men were women from the line of Cain and the sons of the sons in that godly line were marrying the ungodly women and that led to, because you have these mixed marriages of godly and ungodly, that led to a lot of wickedness and that's what this position is. Another view that was developed a little bit earlier than that one, this one actually came about among Jewish exegetes in the uh, late first, early second century and then it was picked up again in uh, recent centuries by many, uh, by many Christians is the royalty view or the divine tyrants view. It's these kings who viewed themselves as being divine and um, they were taking women, whomever they chose, they were bringing them into their harems against their will and that's what this passage is about according to them. And then the fallen angel view, which is the one that I'm going to spend the most time on uh, because it has by far the greatest explanatory power, by far the most biblical support, and by far the most objections to it. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that topic. But that is that the sons of God were heavenly beings, uh, rebellious angels who came down, married women, had children with them, and their offspring were the Nephilim, uh, who were giants. And... Um, some people think that the angels just possessed men to do that. In fact, that's a, a, kind of an offshoot of this view called the demon possessed men view. Um, well, we won't spend a lot of time on that. But one, the Bible doesn't say that they possessed men to do it. It just says that the angels, the, the sons of God did this. There are, uh, there's a couple other lesser views. The Canaanite view, hardly anyone holds this view. It's that the, it kind of reversed the two lines. So instead of it being the godly line is the line of Seth, this was the sons of God would be the line of Cain and then the daughters of men line, that would be the the line of Seth. And part of the argument for that view is that the only line that mentions daughters over and over and over again is the Sethite line, not the Canaanite line. In fact, there's only one daughter mentioned in the entire Canaanite line, and that's uh, Naamah at the very end of that line. And then the liberal view among liberal theologians, you know, they don't really believe this passage at all anyways. It's just all mythological. They just say that it's borrowed from the pagans and it's just put in there, like this is what they always say about just about any passage they don't really believe. Oh, it's just a polemic against this certain group. Well, the only way that it can be a, an effective polemic is if it's true. Otherwise, it's just my myth is better than your myth. And yet this is what they default to so many times. So let's take a look at these three major views. First of all, the Sethite view, what uh, strengths and weaknesses are there? Well, in Genesis chapter 4, here's one of the positive arguments. And, and what I'm going to outline for you, or what I, what I call the positive arguments, are those arguments that are used in favor of that position. Most of the time what people will do when they argue for the Sethite view is just attack the fallen angel view. Well, that's not, a, that's not an argument for your own view. That's just an argument against another one. There are other views besides just the Sethite view. So even if you disprove the fallen angel view, you wouldn't prove your own. So one positive argument they give is that Genesis 4 and 5 do discuss those two lines, the lines of Cain and the line of Seth. We know that some of the Sethites were godly. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. We know those two men were godly. 
And we know that some of the Cainites were ungodly. We know that Cain was ungodly, and we know that the man at the end of that line, Lamech, the guy who was a polygamist and he uh, murdered a young man and bragged about it, we know he was not a very godly man. And the last positive view for the Sethite position is, uh, it's the dominant view in church history from the end of the fourth century until the 20th century. That's it. And yet this is what so many people have held today, that that's all they have for positive arguments. And there are a lot of weaknesses with this position that people don't bring up. It cannot explain so many other biblical passages. For example, Numbers 13.33, the only other passage that mentions the Nephilim is when the spies go into the land and then come back and give their report. And we'll look at that in more detail a little bit later. But they can't account for what's talked about in that passage. They can't account for the three passages in the New Testament that talk about angels who sinned and they, it links it with the time of Noah and now, are now held in chains of darkness until the day of judgment. They, when you look at their explanation of those passages, they have to, to twist things around quite a bit to try to make it work and what's going on there. So we'll look at each of those verses in much more detail a little bit later. Another weakness is why would the offspring of these unions be unique? If a godly person married an ungodly person, why is that going to produce giants? Why is that going to do anything different than what we see at any other time in history where godly people married ungodly people? Why would such a common sin bring about such a harsh judgment of the flood? This is something that is setting up the flood account in Genesis chapter 6. So why is what happened here so awful? Yes, it's not a good thing when a believer marries an unbeliever. That, I'm not trying to make light of that. But that's something that has happened throughout history. And we don't see severe consequences as a result of it like we're seeing in Genesis 6. And how about this? If they were so godly, this, this line of Seth, if they were always godly men, why are they constantly marrying ungodly women? Again, you might get that every once in a while, but all the time? Then I would have to conclude that maybe they weren't that godly. In fact, where does the Bible ever tell us that Cain's line was ungodly and that Noah's line was godly? It doesn't. We like to assume that but actually what's being done there, and in fact this is one of the reasons why this view is so popular among people from a reform background, especially from a covenantal background, it should be a little more specific, because they like to see those two lines, the elect and the non-elect throughout history, and so they like this position because they say, oh, this line's clearly the elect, this line is clearly the non-elect, but they're imposing that framework over the top of the text. The Bible never tells us those things about those people, other than the ones that I mentioned earlier. So we know that two of the people in Cain's line have got a title for God in their name, Mahujael and Methushael. Is that some sort of acknowledgement that these people still acknowledge the creator at that point? Maybe, or do they just have a, a name that you know, was a popular name and they were given that name whether or not it had any uh, indication of their godliness or lack thereof. But in Genesis 4.26, it says, As for Seth, so Adam's son Seth, to him a son was also born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of Yahweh. It does not say only people in Seth's line called on Yahweh. So in that third generation, people in general were calling on the name of the Lord. That would include people in the line of Cain. So we should not automatically assume that Cain's line was all ungodly. Certainly by the end, by the time of the flood, Everybody in each of the lines were ungodly. And there weren't just two lines from Adam either. Okay, Genesis 5, 4, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Okay, this, this view kind of excludes all of them, doesn't even talk about them. But there were plenty of sons and daughters from Adam and Eve. And how about this term, this, the term sons, when you see that in Scripture, in the Old Testament. Does that imply godliness? They'll say, well, if they were sons of God, they must have been godly. Why is that? Because this, the term sons is really just, a, it, the way it's used in, in connection with another term is, is a Hebrew idiom, identify, it can be used that way as identifying somebody as a member of a particular class. For example, the sons of the prophets. Okay, over and over again, we see that phrase throughout 2 Kings, and in that, in that section of the Bible, you see the sons of the prophets. Were they all actually biological sons of other prophets? Or were they just part of a group of prophets, and so they're, they're identified as the sons of the prophets? And the, the latter is the case in that. And this view is not found in the text. Let me show you what they have to do to this passage. Genesis 6, 1, it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth. Mankind is referring to whom? One specific line or all people in general? All people in general or all men in general in this case. And daughters were born to them. 
Now, who are the daughters referring to? The daughters of which men? All men, right? Well, nope, they change it to just the line of Seth. You see what they've done? Just in, that, in those, that one verse, you go from all mankind in general to man in particular, just a specific line, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and so they're saying these daughters of men, actually, I, I misspoke a little bit, daughters were born to them, they might still say that this is all mankind, but then when you get to verse two, now it's just talking about the line of Seth. Well, what hermeneutical justification do you have for changing the meaning of daughters were born to them to daughters of men means somebody different? It's a different group of people, one verse right after the other. Of course, there is no justification for that. Yahweh said, my spirit will not remain in, with man indefinitely. This is mankind in general again. The next verse, the sons of God went into the daughters of men. Now it's just this one line again. Do you see what's happening? We're the, now this, the daughters of men, this is just that line of Cain, the ungodly women. So they're going back and forth interpreting men as in general to particular, in general, in particular. And in verse 5 again, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Well, this is all mankind again. So there's no hermeneutical justification for changing the identification of who's being talked about. And yet that's what this view requires. And there's no explanation for the post-flood Nephilim, which we'll look at a little bit later. So let's take a look at the royalty view. This is one that a lot of people are unfamiliar with, but it is becoming more and more popular, especially among scholars today. And this is the one that says that the, the uh, sons of God were uh, kings or judges who viewed themselves as being divine. They were so important. And then they, um, they had these offspring who, of course, were mighty men. And it's understandable how people, you know, the, the son of a king, it would be a prince. He's somebody who's a mighty man of old, a man of renown. He would be famous because of that. So you can kind of understand that idea. Um, in the ancient Near East, you have Pharaoh who's considered to be a god. And in some of the other cultures, you had that concept as well. And so it's really playing off of that. Uh, I mentioned how the offspring could be known as men of renown. Uh, Nimrod uh, seems to be the leader at the rebellion at Babel. And later on, we know he had his, talks about his kingdom at these, at these different places. He was called a gibor, a mighty one. And that phrase is used in Genesis 6, 4, the mighty men of old, men of renown. That's the giborim. So there's a little bit of a connection there. And the word Elohim, so the sons of God is B'nai Ha-Elohim, uh, is sometimes translated in the book of Exodus as judges in some Bibles. So they'll point to these passages and say, here's uh, evidence for this royalty position. Well, here's some of the weaknesses with it. They're overestimating this idea of the divine view of kings in the ancient Near East. A lot of people just assume, oh yeah, the, the kings at that time, they viewed themselves as divine. Actually, that was not very common throughout the ancient Near East. Yes, Pharaoh was viewed, was viewed as divinity, but what they viewed as divine was the whole concept of, of kingship, almost like the British divine right of kings. They viewed the concept of, of kingship coming down from heaven. They didn't view all of their kings as being divine. In fact, the, the one writing that they point to is an Ugaritic epic about Carrot. And he's, he's the king and he's fallen sick and he's on his deathbed. And somebody says, well, could he really be a god because he's, he's sick and dying? And that's the one thing they point to all the time. They say, see, they, the ancient Near East, they, they believe their, their kings were gods. Well, actually, they're, they're, that thing is questioning whether or not that idea is even true. There's no, uh, no specific mention of kings or judges, etc., in Genesis 1 through 6. So that idea has to be read onto the text. And if you uh, look through my book, I'll give you some examples of people who, who do that. Meredith Klein is somebody who reads all sorts of ideas about uh, kingship into the text. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny to see how much he can pull from the text. Well, actually, he's not pulling it from the text. He's um, eisegeting. He's adding his own ideas to the text. The whole concept of taking wives, in English, that sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? They took wives of whomever they chose. Well, that's in the book of Genesis, that's just an idiom for marriage. Abraham took Sarah as wife, and Abraham's brother took his wife as well. Abraham, after Sarah's death, Abraham took Keturah as wife. Uh, Isaac took Rebekah as wife. Did he force her to be his bride? They had never met. And Rebekah was asked, do you want to go with this servant to go and marry Isaac? Yeah, I'll go. She was a willing bride. They, she was not forced into any harem or anything like that. It was just the, this is the, the idiom for marriage. So that's all that's being discussed there. It's not saying that they were brought into their harems against their will or anything. And this view was not developed until 
the allegorical hermeneutic became popular among Jewish interpreters in the late first century, early second century. That's when this view first was promoted. The term Elohim is better understood as an inhabitant for the spiritual realm, not as a human judge. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, it's used at least five different ways in the Old Testament, and I'm going to show you one example of each of these. So first of all, it's used of God over 90% of the time, over 2,000 times that this term is used. It's referring to God in the Old Testament. In the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's also used as members of the divine council, which we'll look at in a little more detail in a few minutes. Uh, in Psalm 82, God, Elohim, this is the one true God, has taken his place in the, the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And that term in both places there, the singular and the plural, is, is the term uses Elohim. So the first one has to be interpreted as singular because he is the one who's taking his stand in the council. The other one has to be plural because he is in the midst of these other entities that are called Elohim. It can refer to angelic beings. Uh, Psalm 8, 5, for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Some translations uh, interpret that as, or translate it as, you have made him a little lower than God. Uh, but the book of Hebrews quotes this from the Septuagint and has it as angels there. I think we have... Uh, the New Testament interpretation of this passage giving us the justification to say that it should be angels there. It can refer to demons. In Psalm, in, I'm sorry, in Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods, they did not know. There's the term Elohim. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Now what's interesting is the New King James does something a little bit strange here. Notice how the, the word uh, to gods is italicized. Because that's how the New King James does it. Because they usually put in italics words that are not in the original to help with readability. However, in this case, that word is in the original. So I'm not sure why they put that in italics. It's saying they sacrifice to demons, not to God. To gods, that, that's the demons that they're sacrificing to. And the ESV does something peculiar as well. Look at how it translates it. They sacrifice to demons that were no gods. To gods, Elohim, they had not. They just contradicted themselves in the first two lines. And it can also refer to the departed spirit of a person. Now, some people that will view this as a little bit controversial. Was this um, Samuel's spirit that was here, or was this a demon? Um, well, here's what the, the woman says. I saw a spirit, an Elohim, ascending out of the earth. Now, the narrator of this passage calls him Samuel four different times. I have a, a, an appendix in the back of the book dealing with just with this passage. Um, and I think there's a lot of other reasons to believe that God allowed Samuel to pronounce this judgment on Saul. But even if that's not the case, this would still be referring to uh, an entity from the spiritual realm. And that's how the word is used. Every, well, the one thing all of those terms have in common is they are all inhabitants of the spiritual realm. All the different individuals, all the entities called Elohim in the Bible. So is it safe to interpret, is it safe to translate Elohim as judges in the book of Exodus in four different places? as the New King James and some other Bibles do. The ESV in each of those has God because the people were to bring them before the judges or the people were to bring them before God. Well, in other verses you have, you will bring them before Yahweh. That's obviously before God. So why wouldn't, when it uses Elohim, why wouldn't that be referring to God as well? Because at that time, when they came to Moses, Moses could go right to the tabernacle and he could talk to God about this issue as he did in certain instances. So I think it makes a lot better sense to view that as referring to God rather than judges. So, mentioning these other gods sometimes makes people nervous, especially as Christians in the West, because we have, in our mind, the letters G-O-D refers to the one all-powerful, all-knowing creator that we just heard about in the last presentation. Only he is omniscient. Only he is eternal. Only he is infinite. And that, those things are true. Absolutely true. But the Bible speaks of other entities as gods many, many times. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. There's that word Elohim. Um, is he saying, you shall have no other non-existent entities before me? How about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? What is offered to idols is anything? Rather, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. So this is what I was referring to at the beginning, at the outset, that Yahweh is God's personal name, that he identifies himself that way. And 
so there is only one all-powerful, all-knowing creator. His name is Yahweh. Okay, and we believe him to be the triune God of the universe, of scripture. But look what it says in Psalm 95. For Yahweh is a great God, a great king above all, Elohim, all gods. If these are non-existent beings, how is that any sort of praise at all? God, you're greater than nothingness. Okay, well, so is everybody in this room. But what he's saying is you are greater than all gods. You are the greatest. You are the most high. Yahweh, who is like you among the Elohim, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? Well, what is this really referring to? Those other entities that are called gods are these spiritual beings, as we'll see in just a little bit, that were placed in charge of the nations at Babel. And uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual forces the principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We often just simply refer to them as demons. And the Old Testament does that in, in uh, Deuteronomy 32, 17, a passage we already looked at. So this concept of the divine council, I want to spend just a few minutes on and uh, maybe a new concept for you. But it, that term comes right out of Psalm 82, 1, a verse that we just briefly looked at earlier. God, Elohim, has taken a stand in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now, there's eight verses in this psalm, and you're going to see a pronouncement from God uh, just blasting these other gods, small g, for not doing what they were supposed to do. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Here's what they were supposed to be doing. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And as a result, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And now this is where this psalm may be familiar to you if if it's not already. I said, you are gods, Elohim, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Why do we recognize that first statement there? Because Jesus quotes it in John chapter 10. And there, right after Jesus says, I and my Father are one, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And of course, Jesus says, why are you going to stone me? And then um, he says, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? He's quoting from Psalm 82. And then he goes on, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. Now think about this for a minute. How do we often interpret this verse in John chapter 10? We think Jesus is saying, oh, there's other people in the Old Testament called God, so what's the big deal if I said I'm the Son of God, right? Is that really what he just said? He just got done saying, I and the Father are one. And then they got mad at him, and they picked up someone and said, oh, no, no, you guys misunderstood. I didn't really mean that I'm equal to God. I'm just another person like you see in the Old Testament. Is that Jesus' argument? Do you ever see him back down like that? No, what's his argument? Psalm 82, guys, that's me. That's who I am. And he doubles down, and they still want to kill him after this. Because he wasn't backpedaling, saying, no, you guys misunderstood me. He's saying, I am divine. And then the last verse in Psalm 82 says this, Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. What does that mean, that God will inherit all the nations? Where do we see something similar to that in Scripture? Well, let's take a look at Deuteronomy 32 again. And this is beginning in verse 7. Here's Moses' farewell address. You know, the people are getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is going to die right after this address. He says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance... When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, when is this? What is he referring to? He's referring to the Babel event. When God separated the people, when he, when he scattered them. It's talking about the Babel event. He, set the, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God or the sons of Israel depending on which translation you have. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. But look what it says next. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So what really happened at Babel 
is God is saying, look, I've given you chance after chance after chance. You still reject me. You still follow me. I told you to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and scatter. That's what he told Noah and his sons. They didn't. Instead, they got together at Babel. They would try to make a name for themselves. And then in the very next, what, what happens, God comes down and scatters them. And it says he separated them according to the number of the sons of God. But he gets Israel. Israel didn't even exist yet. But what do we read about in the very next chapter? Abram. Come out from the land that I will show you and I will make your name great. Remember what were people trying to do at Babel? Make a name for themselves and God humbles them. Abram, humble yourself and I will make your name great. So let's real quickly deal with a textual issue here. The Masoretic text has sons of Israel there. Uh, B'nai Yisrael. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we found two fragments of this passage in Deuteronomy 32.8. One of them has B'nai Elohim, which is the same as what we read in Genesis 6, 2 and 4, the sons of God. And one of them has B'nai El, and then there's no writing there. It hasn't been preserved, but it's enough space there for Elohim or Elim, which would mean the same thing. And the Septuagint, which is the uh, Pentateuch of the Septuagint, was, the translation was begun in the 3rd century B.C., and that has always had angels of God there, Angeloi Theu. So that's always referred to. The oldest writings we have, both in Hebrew and Greek, have sons of God. Whereas the Masoretic text, which uh, is, is not as old, in fact, it, the Leningrad Codex is from about 1008 AD, uh, but of course the uh, Vorlage goes back much earlier than that, maybe to the second or third century AD. But the oldest writings we have have sons of God in that passage, which by the way, sons of Israel doesn't make sense. At Babel, God divided them up according to the number of the sons of Israel. Israel didn't exist at Babel. So that, that doesn't even make sense in the context. And then right after that he says, but God gets Israel? So what's he doing? Well, God is setting up a, in a sense, he's setting up a contest. Okay, you people don't want me? Fine, I'm going to disinherit you. And I'm going to let these other entities rule over you. And you're going to see how bad it is. But I'm still going to win. I'm going to take one guy, make a great nation out of him. And I'm going to accomplish all of my purposes through him. And that's what we see throughout the rest of scripture. So there's that rebellion at Babel. And look what God says there. Let us go down there and confuse their language. And then it says, so Yahweh dispersed the people. And what we see throughout the Old Testament, I'll show you a few places, uh, several places where God does this, where he consults with others and says, hey, what should we do? And then God is the one who does it. He doesn't need their advice, but he allows them to participate. So God, in, God disinherits the nations here at Babel. And... The, the pagan gods are allotted to the nations. You see that in Deuteronomy 32, 8. You'll see it again in Deuteronomy 4, 19 and Deuteronomy 29, 26. It's mentioned three times in that book. But yeah, as I mentioned before, I got ahead of my slides a little bit. Yahweh gets Israel, uh, the nation he's going to found with one man in the next chapter. So is this polytheism? Because I know that makes some people nervous. The first time I read this concept, I thought, I don't like this. It sounds like polytheism. So I read the article again. I was like, I still don't like it. It sounds like polytheism, but, it, but he made some good points. And then I read it the third time. I thought, no, that's, it. that's exactly what it says. It's not polytheism. Uh, polytheism generally places all of the gods, you know, many gods, all at the same level or at least very close to the same uh, characteristics, the same quality. That's not what the Bible teaches clearly. Henotheism is like polythe polytheism, but says only one god may be worshipped. That's not what's being described here either. The Bible teaches that there are many Elohim, many gods, but there is only one Yahweh. There's only one all-powerful, eternal creator, God. And these other entities were made by him, like we've been made by him. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. That makes sense? It's like, um, let me sure, make sure I said it. All, all squares are rectangles, but not all, all rectangles are squares. Okay? Only Yahweh is eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, etc. So let's look real quickly at some examples of the divine counsel that we see in Scripture. And these are some of my favorite passages because there's, there's really a lot of humor in the Bible. If you, um, It's sort of ironic sometimes, but this passage of Micaiah and the divine counsel, you know, where uh, Ahab wants to go up and fight at remote Gilead and retake that. And so he calls Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and says, hey, can you come up and, and help me with this? And Jehoshaphat comes up and, uh, hey, can we have the prophet say what's going to happen? So they bring in all these prophets of Baal. And Jehoshaphat, who's a godly king, says, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh here? And Ahab's response was, awesome. yeah, there's one, but I hate him because he never says anything good about me. <laughs> well, maybe you should change your lifestyle, Ahab. Maybe you should think about who you married um, because she's not very helpful. 
Uh, maybe you should change your ways if the prophet of Yahweh is, is condemning you. Then they go and they get Micaiah and he says, Therefore hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at remote Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. Yahweh said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And Yahweh said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Who is that? Who's that spirit that's right there in God's throne room who, that God is speaking to? I think a lot of times we want to just instantly say, oh, that must be Satan. Well, why would, the Bible doesn't say it was Satan. But it tells us it's going to be a spirit who volunteers to go be a lying spirit. He's, God is seated on his throne. You have the heavenly host around him and God asks for their input. He doesn't need their advice. Just like he doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need their assistance. Just like he really doesn't need our assistance, does he? But he allows us to participate and in the same way he allows the angelic realm to participate in what he's doing. Or I should say in a similar way, not the same way. How about in the book of Isaiah? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it talks about how the heavenly hosts were about him. It even describes some of the seraphim. And it says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. I know a lot of times we want to say, Well, this must be Trinit Trinitarian language. I, I think that in many of these cases... Uh, there's a better explanation. He is speaking to the host around him who was going to go for us, but he's the one who makes the decision. He's the one who does the sending. He's the one in charge. How about in the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of the tree that was chopped down? Look what Daniel says to him. The sentence, sentence is by decree of the watchers. This is another term for the holy ones, for the angelic beings. The decision by the, the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will and sets, it over the, sets over it the lowliest of men. It is a decree of the Most High. Wait, I thought we just heard that it was a decree of the Watchers. But then he says it's a decree of the Most High. Because we have this picture of this council, this divine council, where God is asking for their input. They give their input and sometimes he says, nope. Sometimes he says, yep, let's go do it. But he, again, he's in control. He doesn't need their assistance, but he asks for it. And he allows them to participate. How about in the book of Psalms? We already saw a little bit of this earlier. Psalm 89. Let the heavens praise you, your wonders, O Yahweh, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the heavenly beings is like Yahweh? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Yahweh, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Yahweh, with your faithfulness all around you. Do you see this picture throughout the Bible? That you have... Other entities there, this council that, that God will communicate with, but he, again, he is in charge. But doesn't the Bible say there are no other Elohim besides him? Is that a contradiction? You know what you can do whenever I ask that question? If, that is, if, if that's a contradiction in the Bible, you can say no. Okay? <laughs> there are no contradictions in the Bible, so it's not a contradiction. So why does the Bible say many times that there are no other gods besides him? When we just saw a whole bunch of times where it says there are other gods. Well, look at Isaiah 44. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God, no Elohim. But we just saw places where there are other Elohim. Isaiah 45. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, Yahweh, and there is no other Elohim besides me? And you see this in Deuteronomy as well. The places where these two types of wording occur a lot is Deuteronomy 32 and Isaiah 40 through 45. Those two sections where God is, is saying there's no other besides me. See now that I, even I, am he and there is no Elohim besides me. And yet this passage already spoke about other Elohim. Just 22 verses earlier. Is that a contradiction? No, what God is doing, he's using the language of incomparability. Compared to me, they are nothing. Yes, they exist, but compared to me, they, they don't measure up. They're nothing. So it's the same type of language used about people and nations in the Old Testament. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Well, we're not nothing. We're something. But compared to God, we are nothing. 
All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted as, by him as less than nothing. Maybe that's what exploded at the Big Bang, less than nothing. Right? As we were talking about in the last presentation. Actually, that is kind of what, they, what some of them would argue. Um, so, again, compared to God, we are nothing. But we are something. Okay? In fact, we're made in God's image. How about this passage? Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Sometimes people will point to the Shema, you know, hear, O Israel, and they'll say, well, see, there's just one God. Well, what he said is there's one Yahweh. This is one of the reasons why I use the term Yahweh instead of just the Lord, so you can understand what he's saying here. He's not just giving a, a title, he's giving his name. So at Babel, I mentioned earlier that God is separating the nations according to the number of the sons of God. Well, how many groups went out from Babel? When you add these up, you have 14 different groups from Jephthah, you have 30 from Ham, and you have 26 from Shem. When you go through Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations, that equals, about, that equals 70 different people groups that departed from Babel. What's very interesting is that in the Ugaritic writings, which is a Semitic language, uh, like Hebrew is a Semitic language, their god El had 70 sons that are called Ben Il. Look how similar the language is. Instead of Ben Elohim, it's Ben Il, and they are 70 sons or 70 gods. They called the congregation of the stars, kind of similar to what we just saw in the Old Testament. In Canaan, Baal, Baal held counsel over the gods, and El was his son and his equal. And we see that picture elsewhere in other pagan religions, don't we? Mount Olympus, Zeus, and that's where Zeus and the Olympians uh, met. Okay, their, their chief gods were on, on Mount Olympus. Uh, the uh, Mount Hermon is uh, or also called Syrian or Sinir. In Deuteronomy 3.9 it's mentioned, El of the Ugaritic people, that's where he held counsel. And in Mount, Mount Zaphon is where Baal of the Canaanites held counsel, and that's what we see in Isaiah 14. 12 and 13, a passage that we're very familiar with because we often interpret this referring to uh, Satan. And uh, whether it is or not, that's a debate to be had at another time. But what's really being drawn upon here, this is where the I will, I will, I will. Look at the last one. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. Have you ever wondered what that meant? Or some Bible would say the mount of the congregation of the north. It used the word Zaphon, which is the Hebrew word uh, for the north. It became the word for the north end of Israel where Mount Zaphon was. This is where the Canaanites believed their gods met in council. So this entity is claiming he's going to be the chief one among them. That's what's being referred to there. So you have this picture woven throughout the Old Testament of these where the God is going to meet them on the mountain. Well, what, where did God meet the people when they came out of Egypt? On Mount Sinai. And so what we see, oftentimes what is, in, what is reality in heaven, we see that duplicated on earth. Think about this whole idea of 70 sons where Yahweh is ruling over the council. Where else do we see that concept in scripture? When Moses selects the elders of Israel, how many? 70, and he is ruling over them, right? The great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, how many? 70 with the high priest ruling over them. It's as if they're shadows of what is the reality. So one of the things that we often miss in the Old Testament, and then we're going to get on to more about the fallen angel view. So I told you we're going to talk about the divine council real quickly, and then we'll move on to that. Um, and then we'll talk about the Nephilim. We'll get there. Um, bear with me. This whole concept of Yahweh versus the gods of the nations. We often talk about how God sets up kings and, and tears down nations and everything. One thing we often miss in that is he's not just doing that to the nations. He's not just doing that to the kings. He's also doing that to their gods. What does he say in Exodus 12, 12 about the plagues? I will execute my judgment against all the gods of Egypt. Every one of those plagues is directed against one of the gods of Egypt so that the people would know he's more powerful than Pharaoh. He's more powerful than Isis. He's more powerful than all these different gods and goddesses. And you see that continuing. When the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines, they put it in the Temple of Dagon. What happens? Poof. Falls down before the, the Ark of the Covenant. So they put him back up and stand the, the merman up, you know, Dagon, and the next day what happens? He falls down again, this time his head's broken off and his arms are broken off because the pagan gods cannot stand before Yahweh. And Elijah, the prophets of Baal, uh, another story, where there, another passage where there's a lot of humor in there, but what's really happening behind the scenes? God is demonstrating that he is more powerful than, than Baal and all these other gods that are being worshipped by Jezebel and these other people. And Israel versus Ben-Hadad, you'll see this um, very clearly. Ahab is the king of Israel at that time. When, they, when the Syrians come down and attack and they lose, 
What is the Syrian king told, Ben-Hadad? Oh, Yahweh is a god of the hills. If we fight him in the valleys, we'll win this time. And then what happens again? Then he gets destroyed the next time too because Yahweh is not just a god of one place. He is the god of heaven and earth and of all things. You see it with Naaman the Syrian. Remember when he came to be healed by Elisha? What was the one thing he asked for afterwards? Asked for two loads of dirt. Why? Because he said what he wanted to do is bring that back. He thought that Yahweh was the God of Israel, not of every place. And so he could actually worship Yahweh back where he was if he had land from Israel. He thought it was connected to the dirt. It wasn't, but that's what he believed was going on. And then you see it with Hezekiah and Assyria very clearly. You have the, the Rabshakeh, the, the mouthpiece for the king of Assyria, for Sennacherib, who's just bragging and boasting, where is your God, the gods of all these nations? Could they stop my king? They couldn't do anything against him. What makes you think Yahweh can stop you? That was a big mistake. <laughs> because Yahweh's not just one of these little gods of one of these little towns. He is the creator. He's the God of heaven and earth. And in one night, an angel of the Lord went out and killed 185,000 Assyrians. I like the way the New King James puts it. And when the people got up in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. <laughs> yeah, of course the corpses are dead. But that's the way it words it. All right, so let's take a look at the fallen angel view. With that as a backdrop now, let's look at the positive arguments. Um, I'm sorry, I just copied and pasted from the beginning one and forgot to correct that one. The term Bene Elohim, sons of God, refers to angelic beings elsewhere in Scripture. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, whenever it is used, it's referring to angelic beings. For example, Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, there's the term, Bene Elohim shouted for joy. It cannot be referring to human beings here because human beings did not exist at this moment. This is referring to when God was laying the foundations of the earth, when he was crea creating everything, before he made man. So there's a very clear-cut example of B'nai Elohim that cannot refer to human beings. In the same book, this word is used two other times. Job 1, 6, Now there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And of course, this is where you're going to get that test of Job. In the very next chapter, almost the same identical verse, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So you have three times in the book of Job where this is clearly referring to spiritual beings. And the only other place where this occurs outside of Genesis 6 is the one passage we looked at earlier where it's debated whether or not it's B'nai Elohim or B'nai Yisrael and all of the oldest manuscripts we have say B'nai Elohim in Deuteronomy 32. So the Aramaic equivalent of that term in the book of Daniel also refers to a spiritual being, to a heavenly being. Take a look. When the... the Daniel's friends are thrown into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar says, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are, they are not hurt. And the fourth, I'm sorry, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods, or some translations say the son of God. The, word is, the term there is bar Elohim, the Aramaic equivalent of b'nai Elohim. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel. So in Nebuchadnezzar's understanding, this one walking around in the furnace with them was a heavenly being, a divine being, and he also called him an angel. So it shows how the mindset of the people there. I'm not saying we should take our cue from Nebuchadnezzar and how to interpret scripture, but it helps you understand the mindset of the people at that time. The similar terms also refer to angelic beings. Uh, so we looked at Psalm 89 before. Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Is like, it, so that term is B'nai Elim instead of B'nai Elohim. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, Psalm 29. That's B'nai Elim again. The New Testament passages seem to confirm this view. There are three of them that I mentioned before that, that seem to clearly refer back to this event. Uh, in 1 Peter 3.18, talks about how Christ died also for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. There were spirits who were disobedient in Noah's day that are now are, are in prison. Who were those spirits? Well, I think that Second Peter and Jude shed some light on that for us. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them to hell, this is the only word, time that word tartarosis is used in the Greek, uh, and it's translated as hell in our Bibles, uh, but int interestingly enough, this is where the Titans were locked away by Zeus in Greek mythology, Tartarus. 
And Peter uses that word. And committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. There are certain angelic beings that were held in chains until they have judgment. They're not the demons roaming around in the New Testament possessing people because they're bound. They're held in chains. Who are they? And Jude says something very similar. Angels who did not keep their own dom domain but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I think the only view that can make sense of these passages is the fallen angel view. If you understand Genesis 6 to be talking about that, then this is very easy to understand. In fact, in the book of Jude, he quotes from first Enoch, where he says, now Enoch the seventh from Adam. Well, what's the book of Enoch about? It's all about expanding what happened in Genesis chapter 6, and it goes on, and, and I'm not saying let's base our view on the book of Enoch, not at all. In fact, this is the first time I mentioned it. But Jude clearly knew that book and knew his readers knew that book. And he's referring to event, an event that the book of Enoch talks about and actually dwells upon. It's the earliest Jewish view by far. The Septuagint has that, it repeatedly re translates that as angels of God or sons of God. It, it uses those in, interchangeably. I mentioned first Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the Genesis of Apocryphon, a lot of these books from the intertestamental period, uh, Damascus document, Second Baruch, Judith, uh, one of the... Uh, the apocryphal books that the, the Catholic Church added back in 1546 uh, refers to sons of the Titans. Uh, the Testament of Reuben, Testament of Naphtali, a lot of these intertestamental period books all have this idea that the sons of God were angelic beings who came down and married women. It's the earliest Christian view by far. Uh, you see that among the church fathers. I've got a whole chapter just on the early Jewish writers. I've got a whole chapter just on the ancient church fathers, so I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time telling you all of them, but just real quickly, there are several of them. And it really wasn't until the middle of the third century that somebody started to hold a different view in the church. And it presents a consistent hermeneutic, as we already saw in the book of Job. Sons of God is referring to angelic beings. It means the same thing each time that it's used. It explains the severe judgment of the flood. It explains the se severe judgment of a reduced lifespan, which we'll get to in just a little bit, the, that concept of the 120 years. It also explains the origin of the Nephilim, both pre-flood and post-flood. The sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children, and these were the mighty men of the, That's when the Nephilim were on the earth. So let's, let's continue, well, let's address some of the objections, and I'll come back to that point in just a little bit. Can angels even take human form? This is one of the major objections you hear. Of course, it's not the major one. We'll, I'm saving that one for last. But this is one of the big objections. Well, angels can't even do this. How do you know? We know in the Old Testament that Gabriel appears and talks to Daniel. And it, it, in Daniel 9, he even calls him the man Gabriel because he appears in human form. Two angels come and talk to Abraham and then they go to the city of Sodom and pull Lot out of there. New Testament examples, there's angels at the tomb that, are, that appear as men. In fact, two of the Gospels call them men. And then in Hebrews 13, we're told to make sure that we are hospitable to strangers because some people have been entertaining angels unaware. Apparently, they can show up and appear as human beings. And when people say, well, angels are spirit, they could never do this. When, when the Bible talks about angelic beings that way, they're not formless. They're not omnipresent like God is omnipresent. They're not the same sort of spirit that God is spirit. Does that make sense? Angels are localized in some way to some sort of body. What are they made of? I don't know. I think it was Thiessen who said they're made of angel stuff. That's the best I can do with it. But they're, they're not omnipresent. Okay? And they're even described in Scripture. You, know, you can read Isaiah 6 and, talk, and it talks about the seraphim with their, their wings and other things. So you see those descriptions. They're, they're not just spirit as if they're bodiless. Um, so they are... They're not formless, and they, we know that they can take human form. At least some of them can. I'm not saying that necessarily every single angel can do this. I think one of the mistakes we fall into is we assume that there's... Um, we look at all the diversity of life on earth, and we think, oh, in heaven, there's just God and the angels. Okay, but the angelic realm is also quite diverse as well. And we shouldn't assume that they're all identical in power and all uh, in ability and everything, or that they even all have the same characteristics or descriptions. I, read Revel you, I know you guys have read Re Re Revelation. What about the ones that have eyes covering them? You know, uh, there's they're very different description of, of angelic beings throughout Scripture. Can angels procreate? Of course, this is a big objection. Um, we know angels can perform human actions. They ate and drank with Abram. They grabbed Lot by the hand and pulled him out of the city. Of course, they're speaking to people. The people of Sodom thought that they could have done something sexual with them. In fact, that's what they wanted to do. Um, so we know that godly angels, at least some of them, can manifest and, and perform human 
activities. What about the fallen angels? Can they do that? Well, did Satan manifest during the temptations of Jesus? The Bible doesn't necessarily come right out and say that, but as you read it, you're certainly given that impression that they, he appears and they're talking back and forth about things and they go to different places. It appears that he does. Uh, how about the demonic plagues of Revelation 9? They appear physical because they, they sting people. They, they know People are in pain and misery because of what happens. They're clearly uh, demonic entities. And this last one will be the most objectionable for a lot of people. They might even be capable in certain circumstances of creating things. I know oftentimes we're told in our theology, only God creates, Satan just corrupts. Well, you have to explain this verse then. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. I know sometimes we try to explain it in a way that's, oh no, they charmed serpents so they were rigid and looked like a snake, and when it hit the floor, it writhed around. That's not what it says, is it? So they threw down their staffs, and they and the staffs became serpents. They did it through their dark arts, through their secret arts, through their occultic ways and they were able to duplicate the next couple of plagues as well the the water into blood and the frogs so sometimes maybe we are underestimating our enemy and we try to make excuses for what the bible seems to be saying here maybe angelic beings are a lot more powerful than what we give them credit for but what does what does the bible tell us in the new testament he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world we don't need to fear them because of who is in us. How about this concept? And this is one that I've heard um, where, you know, where I work, there's people who talk about creation quite a bit, as you can imagine. Well, in Genesis chapter one, uh, you have this phrase, 10 times after their kind, they'll bring forth after their kind. The, the plants bring forth after their kind, the animals bring forth after their kind. And they say, well, this couldn't happen because only, humans can only bring forth humans. Well, who says they're not bringing forth humans according to the fallen angel view? They're still called mighty men of old, men of renown. But where does that concept ever say anything? Where does it ever say after their kind about humans in Genesis 1? It doesn't. It does about everything else, but it doesn't say that about humans. By the way, I'm not using that as a major argument. I'm just saying that you're making an assumption about the text that isn't in the text. Now, all we've ever observed is humans bring forth humans. And all we're, dogs will bring forth dogs, cats bring forth cats. You know, that, that's a, a standard principle. But the issue here is whether or not angels can assume human form and perform human functions. And are they capable of doing that? The offspring, again, are called mighty men of old, men of renown. They're human. That brings up the question whether or not angels are made in the image of God. Oftentimes we say, well, humans are the only ones made in the image of God. How do we know that? Humans are the only physical entities here on earth. The animals are not made in God's image, but human beings are. But if you try to describe what the image of God is, and again, look at different theologians, you'll get all sorts of different responses trying to figure out, what does that exactly mean that we're made in God's image? You'll get a range of different descriptions, of different abilities, we're imagers of God, all sorts of things. And every single thing that is brought up can also be used about the angelic realm. So maybe they are, and maybe that's why they're capable of doing that. Would God really allow something so evil and disgusting? That's an objection, the, the yuck factor. That's just disgusting because they think of demons as being like these warty, toady, horned creatures with the pitchfork, you know, that kind of thing. That's the common picture. But do you think that's really how they're going to appear? If they're going to try to woo a woman? Or do you think they might appear in a much better way? I mean, nobody's disgusted when they watch like the, the Thor movie. And Thor, who's a god from, um, you know, a, a Norse god, and he's, you know, he's a handsome man, he's with a, a beautiful woman. Nobody objects, objects to that and say, oh, that's disgusting. But that's how they would, I mean, obviously they would appear desirable. But God allows all sorts of evil activities to take place. I don't like the fact that a million babies every single year are slaughtered in the U.S. in their mother's womb. But it happens. We don't get to deny it just because we don't like it. Okay? It's tragic, it happens, rape happens, murder happens, incest, all these things happen. God permits these things. And he can bring good out of those things, and often does. He can redeem those things. So why would we just single out one activity and say, oh, that can never happen, God would never allow it. Would the Bible even call this marriage? Well, the Bible calls lots of things marriage that are not ideal. Polygamy is referred to as marriage. Um, the non-ideal can still be marriage. There's also true worship and false worship in the Old Testament. They're both called worship, 
in the Bible, but some are of the one true God, and sometimes even when we're trying to worship the one true God, we're doing it in the wrong way, and it's still false worship, but then we're also, sometimes people are worshiping false gods, and it's still called worship. So we don't, it's just more of a semantic argument to try to say, oh, the, the, the Bible would never say that that's marriage, trying to explain away what it does say. Why would, un, why would the Bible call ungodly beings, rebellious angels, sons of God? Uh, well, Christians, we're called we will be sons of God. We're called sons of God in the New Testament a couple of times, and most of the time that it's used, it's referring to what we will be in the future. We are currently sons of God, but what we will become is not yet fully realized. That's the way it's used. So positionally, we're sons of God, but the whole world is waiting for the, for the revealing of the sons of God. Romans 8, a passage that we looked at in the last talk, talks about that. Sons of, again, refers to a class of entities. So these are... Um, these are beings that are from the angelic realm that belong to a class of beings known as Elohim. How about this one? Here's the big one. Did Jesus say that angels cannot marry? Well, in Matthew 22, 30, he says, in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like, sons of, are, are like angels of God in heaven. See, Jesus said they can't do it, therefore that view is false. How dare you even teach that view? And some people get really emotional about this. And, and we really shouldn't. It's not like this is a salvation issue. It's not like people who hold to the royalty view are now out of the kingdom or you know, they, they're not saved. I mean, that's not at all what we're talking about here. But did Jesus say that angels cannot marry there? He said the angels of God in heaven don't do this. Did he say anything about the angels who left their proper abode and what they can do? Or did he just say what the holy angels don't do? That's in Matthew 22. Mark says almost the same thing. Um, he says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But um, Luke has a little more detail, and I think you might find this interesting in light of our discussion so far. In fact, he might possibly show that Jesus is giving a nod to the fallen angel view. Now, I, I wouldn't use this as a primary evidence or anything, but just look at what he says here. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. When we're sons of the resurrection, what are we? Sons of God, and we are then what? Equal to the angels. It's almost, you maybe can see in there that he's saying, yes, sons of God is equal to angels. But again, I wouldn't use that as a primary argument, but what I am saying is that he did not rule it out in this passage. He clearly did not rule it out. Was it borrowed from pagan mythology? Well, you know what's interesting, and I've done a lot of research on this in, uh, again, where I work, I, I deal with this quite a bit, but we find elements of Genesis 1 through 11, major elements throughout the cultures of the world, the, these ancient, ancient cultures. We have creation accounts that are very similar to the biblical account, especially the creation of man being made from the dust of the ground, and then this wind comes along and makes them alive, or the great spirit, you know, brings them to life. You have that concept in several different cultures. You have the reason man became bad, and the reason man dies, has something to do with a serpent and or a tree in over a hundred different cultures. You have flood accounts in over 200 different cultures. Some people say over 400 flood legends. I know there's at least 200 because I read over 200 of them for the exhibit that I wrote at the Ark Encounter. Uh, there are Babel legends. I think we've counted at least 23 of them where there are Babel legends from these different cultures around the globe. You know what else they have legends about in all of these different cultures or a lot of these cultures? The gods coming down and marrying women and, or at least um, siring children with those women and those offspring are either giants or demigods. You find that all over the place. But once you get to Genesis 12 and onward, you don't see any similarities anymore. No more Abraham, there's no Abraham legends all over the place. Why? Because what God did at Babel, these people had a shared history at that point. And then they scattered and passed that history on generation after generation after generation. Of course, there's distortions that come along. It's like the telephone game. There's, you get all sorts of weird, crazy things going on. But there's still that kernel of truth there. And that's one of the views that is found throughout the world, is this idea of the gods coming down and having children with women. So actually, the shoe is on the other foot when it comes to this approach, when people say that they're borrowing from the pagans. The allegorical hermeneutic arose among the Greek philosophers to save the stories about their gods to save Homer and Hesiod because people loved and revered those stories like the Iliad and the Odyssey 
And yet their gods were doing all sorts of unpalatable things. They were liars, they were, they were thieves, they slept around, they did all these things. But the Greeks loved their stories, and yet by the time the Greek philosophy came around, they're, they're saying, this is irrational, it doesn't make any sense. They reinterpreted all of those different gods as being about different concepts or something to stand for something else. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a book out there, not a Christian book at all, but it's by Luc Brisson, How Philosophy Saved Myth. And he goes into a lot of detail about this. Um, so they were embarrassed by the stories about their gods, so they reinterpreted it to mean something else. And in that way, they kept their stories. Have we not seen the same thing happen when Christians, especially those more of a more liberal persuasion, do that with Scripture? They reinterpret it. Well, that's what happened. Uh, think of how that goes from Athens to Alexandria. And when did the Sethite view and the ro royalty view come about? It was after this hermeneutic impacted the Jewish people at the, end, at the close of the first century, the beginning of the second century, and then into the Christian in interpretation in the third century, in the fourth century, they started to allegorize things. Actually, those two views are rooted in a pagan hermeneutic. Why would the fallen angels do this? Well, the Bible says they saw women and that they were beautiful and they longed for them. Maybe, maybe it's lust. Um, perhaps it was the, some people tie it to Genesis 3.15. They think it was an attempt to uh, taint the messianic bloodline. Um, and th that's a possibility. And maybe that's one of the, the reasons for the flood that God is wiping everybody out except for those eight people. Perhaps it was an attempt to attain immortality. How? Well, if... If people are going to now die, which they weren't supposed to originally, but then when Adam sinned, it brought death into this world, um, maybe if spiritual beings who are immortal, at least that's the idea, um, have offspring with those who are mortal, maybe those offspring would be immortal. Possibly. That's an attempt to do that, to circumvent what God said. If you eat from this, you will surely die. So anyways, real quickly, what's the deal with 120 years? And we'll get to the Nephilim and then we'll take questions. Um, a lot of people view this as like a countdown to the flood. The Bible never connects that passage directly to the flood. In fact, it's smack dab in the middle of the sons of God in the Nephilim passage. Some people, there's an odd view out there that, I don't know if I should say odd. There's a, a rare view called the Jubilee's view that, uh, you know, a Jubilee is a 50-year period. There's going to be 120 of those that equal 6,000 years. That's how long man has on earth. Um, the a, there's a likelihood that we're already past that. And the Bible doesn't say anything about jubilees here. It's just a, that's kind of read into the text. I think what makes the most sense is God is saying, hey, Adam, when, when you eat from this, you're going to surely die. And we see people living to 900 years old. 969 for the Methuselah. Adam, 930. Noah, 950. But God says this shortly before the flood. You guys, look how wicked you become when I allow you to live so long. So now what's going to happen, your lifespan is going to be reduced, so you can, it's a way to curb the wickedness. And only one person after Moses lives past 120 years, Jehoiada the priest. So what you have is that from Noah's time all the way down to Moses, you see the steady decline of the lifespan all the way to Moses, the guy who wrote this passage, and nobody outlives 120. Even today, nobody outlives 120. We get to 116, 117, 118, we don't pass 120. I think that's what God's saying here. Is I'm, I'm going to curb the amount of wickedness you can do. But that will change, as we just heard in the last talk, in the millennium. Because people are going to live a lot longer. The people who die at 100 are going to be accounted as children. And it's interesting, the Bible stops recording the person's age at death shortly after Moses. We find out Joshua was 110, and then it just stops telling us about how old each of these people lived most of the time. But before that, it was telling us very clearly how old they lived. And if you were one of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness and you're getting Genesis for the first time and Moses is reciting this to you, Adam lived 100, 930 years and he died. Um, Enos, you know, Seth lived 912 years and he died. Noah lives 950 and he dies. What's the question that's on your mind? Why don't we live that long? Oh, let me read the next passage. You're going to not pass 120. And then that's what, what happens. Okay, so here's who were the Nephilim. The Bible tells us the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. I would submit that that means before the flood and also after the flood. Whenever the sons of God went into the daughters of men who bore to them children, they were the mighty men of antiquity, men of renown. The key word right there is this word when or whenever. Most Bibles will translate it as when, which makes it very vague about what the passage is saying. Is, were the Nephilim on the earth already when this was happening? Or were the Nephilim there as a result of this happening? Uh, Gazenius' uh, second edition of the Hebrew grammar says that when it appears, in a, when this word asher appears in association with an imperfect verb, it's used to express actions which were repeated in the past, either at fixed intervals or occasionally. It's something that is repeated, it's ongoing. In other words, whenever. Um, the, 
I've got several other quotes here that I give that should be translated as whenever, not when, because it specifies what's going on. The Nephilim were on the earth whenever the sons of God did this. In other words, the Nephilim are the result of these unions. They're the offspring. And it happened in those days and also afterward. Uh, Since Moses is writing this, I think that it is safe to assume he's talking about before the flood and also after the flood because of what we read about in Numbers 13, but which we'll get to in just a little bit. So the Nephilim were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men or the offspring of the, the Nephilim themselves in later generations. They were gibberim, they were mighty men, but not all gibberim, not all mighty men are Nephilim. It does not mean, this is an important point, it does not mean fallen ones. Okay, when I set out to do my research, I looked, I thought it meant fallen ones. In fact, I looked through commentary after commentary after commentary after commentary, lexicon after lexicon after lexicon, trying to find somebody who would say it means fallen ones. They don't. Where you're going to find that is on popular resources and on internet web pages. You're going to find a lot of people saying it means fallen ones. It doesn't mean fallen ones. You won't find that in the lexicons. Okay, if it meant fallen ones, they try to tie it to the Hebrew verb nafal, which is to fall. But if you were to do that, if you want to make a participle out of that to make it fallen ones or ones who fall, it would become nophilim or nephulim. It does not become nephilim. Okay, it's a different word. There is an Aramaic noun, nafil, which when you make it plural becomes nephilim. In Aramaic, the masculine plural is in. In Hebrew, the masculine plural is I am, as in Mary. So when you take that as a loan word into Hebrew, it becomes Nephilim. That word just means giants. And that's how every lexicon defines it. What, and that's how they're described in Numbers 13. There also we saw the, the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They're saying we were really small compared to them. In other words, they were giants. Now, a lot of times people say, yeah, but those are the spies. They were lying about it. Or they were just exaggerating. Well, they may have been exaggerating, but they weren't lying about seeing the Anakim there. Numbers describes them as giants. The, and I just mentioned that, but they were cowards, but they weren't lying about the giants being there. Uh, that word that's used there, that they gave a report or they gave a bad report, that's the same word that's used of Joseph in Genesis 37 when he gave a bad report about his brother. It wasn't a lie about his brothers. It was a report of bad things that they were doing. The spies, I mentioned, did not lie about the giants. The narrator himself, Moses, tells us that they saw the sons of Anak there. He even names them. He says there, that they were Ahiman, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai were there, the descendants of Anak. Those aren't the spies saying those words. That's the narrator telling us that. So why were the Israelites afraid of them? They remember, think about this. You're one of the Israelites who just crossed through the Red Sea. You saw all the miracles, all the plagues, God doing all of these things. And suddenly you send spies into the Holy Land and they come back out and they say one thing about giants and it terrifies them. What is going on with these people? Don't you think they should say, well, like Joshua and Caleb, God did all these things, he'll take us right through there and we'll, I mean, that's what they should have done. But why didn't they? Well, when you read through that passage, it, it's interesting. They said, Tr- it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. We are not able to go against the, the people because they are stronger than we. And they, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. What does that mean? You look in a lot of different commentaries and they'll try to figure out some sort of figurative way to talk about how it devours its inhabitants. Oh, it's a land that's filled with war and everything. They're always constantly fighting. Well, that's a good thing if you want to go and conquer them. They should all be worn out and wiped out. It should be pretty easy. That's not what they're referring to. I I submit that what they're referring to is that these men of great stature were cannibals. And they were eating people. And that is what terrified the Israelites. In fact, Joshua and Caleb actually kind of make a comment about that in Numbers 14. He says that they're going to be meat for us. Think about that. That's a common idea in literature, isn't it? That the giants are man-eating. Even the whole Jack and the Beanstalk idea. Which, by the way, I don't like those stories. It's always the tall guy that's the bad guy, okay? <laughs> Let's get that out of here, okay? But where do the giants live? Somewhere between heaven and earth. Well, that's kind of interesting. And it's common in ancient Jewish literature as well. The Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, they all describe the Nephilim as being uh, cannibalistic. Think, now, here's just one real strange thing to consider. I'm speculating here. When Joshua comes in and 
they come in from the, from the east and from the southeast and they're driving these people to the sea. They're wiping them out in the, in, during the conquest. If you're going to flee from there, where are you going to go? To the Mediterranean. About 200 years later, there was a battle that took place at Troy, which we read about uh, from Homer. And then there's a man named Odysseus who tries to get home. And that's what the Odyssey is all about. There's one guy trying to get home. Again, I'm speculating. I'm not saying this is a real thing or anything. But think about what he encounters the very first island he goes to, the Lystragonians. It's an island of giants. And they drown, they, they, um, they destroy 21 of his boats and leaving only one of his ships left. And the, the giants run in and spear his men like fish. And they're eating them. The next island he gets to is the Cyclops, which you're probably familiar with that one. Okay, where he is eating Odysseus' men. Both of them feature man. You see this throughout ancient writings and, and stories. Is it possible that maybe there's a shred of historical basis for a guy named Odysseus trying to get home and encountering man-eating giants in the Mediterranean at that time? Maybe. All right, let's... Uh, I don't know. Again, I mentioned I'm speculating. So what happened to them? Well, they died. And during the conquest, all of them were wiped out, except for the, none of the Anakim were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, Gath, and in Ashdod. Well, who happened to be from Gath? Goliath. And his brothers were, or his, his sons, depending on how that's translated, um, they rem they were, there was war in Gath, or there was war near Gaza. That area, when David's mighty men are there fighting against them, that's where they're fighting, is in that area. There were only giants left in that region. So David, Joshua eliminated most of them. It appears that David and his mighty men finished them off. And what's really interesting, if you track this throughout uh, Deuteronomy and uh, Joshua, and in Numbers as well, the giants were under what's called the kerem, um, the, the ban. They were to be utterly destroyed. And so you know there's certain places in the conquest where God says wipe them out, men, women, and children, and that's very disturbing. He doesn't say that in every place. In fact, that sometimes Moses said you can make um, an offer of peace to these places, the places that are far off, but the ones that are close by. The only places where God says kill them all, men, women, and children, are the places where the Bible describes the giants being. All right. Well, I could talk a lot longer on this, but I know I've already gone a little bit long, I think. So we have... A, 15 minutes or so, let's see. Yeah, we can do some questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, shoot. Oh, by the way, no hard ones. What? Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just short questions. <laughs> Is that mic on? Is that one on? Hello, hello. Go ahead. Hello, hello. Okay, now it's working. All right. My name is Carlos Stages, and uh, I was listening to your presentation. Very, very good. Uh, I have not made a decision yet about the angel um, hybrid position yet, because I have these questions. Uh, first, is the angels and reproduction? Did not God create angels with a set number in mind? and that with the uh, uh, reprodu reproduction capabilities. Mm -hmm. That's one question. The other one will be, uh, when we read in Job 38.7, it's talking about that the angels are related as the Son of God. And it's very clear that it's the creation account mm -hmm. that is in mind. But when we see in Job 2.1, and um, also the other one that will be Job 1.16, it seems like a, Satan is appearing in his fallen state among the Son of God. So it seems like a, once Satan falls into sin with the third of the angels, they are no longer refers to sons of God. And the other one is in 1 Peter 3.18 to 20 and 2 Peter 2, 4 to 5. We have that still being spirits, demons, and Jude 5 to 6, demons as well. And, um, and then also Jesus said that the last day will be like the days of Noah, where it will be taken up and the other one will be left just to live on the earth. I know that, but that means then that in the future, are we going to have this kind of hybrid uh, people 
Do we see that in Google Revelation? I don't see any anything like that in okay. Google Revelation. Let me deal with the last question first. When Jesus says in Matthew 24 that as in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. He's talking about the immediacy of the judgment. That the people, they're, you know, they're, they're not recognizing the signs of the times. That's what he's going after. He's not saying everything that happened in the days of Noah must be repeated you know, at the end time. So I'm not saying that there has to be this hybrid sort of thing going on anymore. Uh, or that it will happen again. I know some people who hold this view take that verse that way, and I, I think it's within the realm of possibility that, that you could interpret it that way, but that he's not using the same phrasing that's happening in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. He, he's not quoting the Septuagint there or anything, using the identical phrasing. So I, I don't think we have to tie the two things together um, in what he says in Matthew 24 compared to Genesis 6. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. Yes, the other one, the first one was the angel Oh, was there a set number of angels? Yes. Yes. Um, do, do you have a, a passage of scripture that says that, or is that something that we have theologized about? No, I mean, uh, what, what I see in the scripture is that, you know, uh, I think the book of Revelation says that he's coming with, uh, you know, mil millions. Thousands or ten thousands. Yeah, myriads. Yeah. Exactly. So it seems like a, he's, he's a set up number. And also, it seems like after Satan fall with the other angels, they lose they lose the the uh, the capability yep. so of appearing me, as a human being. Let me address those. So, what I'm proposing here is not that angels are creating other angels. Okay, what I said the offspring were, were the nephilim. They're men, mighty men of old, men of renown. They're large men. Okay, much bigger than me, but um, they are not angelic beings. And so some people try to think of them as like angel-human hybrid, and that's why they're different. I would submit that they had human DNA, um, that the angel somehow became, took on human form in order to accomplish this, this thing. So they're not creating other angels, they're, they're producing, they're procreating and producing more men. Or, um, and then as far as Satan, um, I don't know if your question had to do whether or not he's allowed to go back into heaven at that point, uh, but because the, He's, he's there among them. Satan is not necessarily one of the sons of God. Okay, that seems to be referring to a particular class of angelic being. And Satan, if Ezekiel 28 is about him, he's one of the, he's a, a cherub, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily one of the B'nai Elohim. Yes, but I think that the point is that in, in, the, in the passage of creation, Job 38, verse 7, is talking about before this is, is fallen state. So even if he's a cherubim and appears the sons of God, he was considered a son of God right there, but then after he fall, it seems like uh, in Job uh, 1, uh, 1, 6 and Job 2, yep. 1, I understand. he appears among them, the son of God, but, but he's not considered but a even son in, of God. But even in Deuteronomy 32, 8, okay, mm -hmm. if that uses sons of God rather than sons of Israel, uh, which I think the textual evidence is very strong for that, this is still referring to beings who have already rebelled that God is placing in charge over these nations and it still identifies them as sons of God. So again, it's, it's referring to a class of beings that's not saying anything about their godliness or lack of godliness. So, but yeah, good questions. Okay, right there. Thank you, Tim. I agree with your, uh, with the, there's a bias against tall men and I, I resent it myself. Thank you. So I'm with you. Yes. I know, people named David always make me nervous. But just, <laughs> for some reason, I don't know, guarding my forehead and... Yes. There is, a, uh, I know some deliverance ministries teach that um, there's a difference between fallen angels and demons. Fallen angels are fallen angels, but demons are the dispossessed spirits of the Nephilim mm -hmm. who were killed during the flood. They're not really alive, they're not really dead. They're incorporeal, whereas angels are corporeal. What what do you think about that distinction between the two orders? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I'm, the reason I'm flipping through here, paging through, is I have a chapter on that very topic. Uh, many of the people who hold to the fallen angel position, and I'm I'm not one of them who holds this particular view of it, would say that um, the uh, let's see. So yeah, chapter 27 of the book deals with that. It's they would say like the early church did. In fact, many of the people in the early church viewed the demons as being the uh, the spirits, departed spirits of the Nephilim drowned in the flood. That was a very common view among the early church. Um, I don't, I'm not convinced by that. I see it as a possibility. There are some, some, some decent arguments that have been made about it. I, I talk about those in the book, but I'm not persuaded by that. I think that when the Bible talks about the devil and his angels, 
that that's what you know hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. I think Jesus is referring to fallen angels as being these entities that the, that the demons that are going around at that time. I think that's what's in mind there. Um, it, just because in the New Testament it seems like they're seeking a body to inhabit, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't exist outside of that and do things outside of that. Um, but that is a a common view among people who hold to the fallen angel view, but it's not the only perspective. So yeah, chapter 27 deals with, with a lot of those arguments. And um, I'm, I'm undecided. Someday if the Lord wants to reveal that, he will. And so I, I kind of have a feeling I'm not going to care that much when I'm with him. But, but maybe he'll explain it. Okay. Uh, three very brief questions. Okay. Uh, the first one, when you spoke of the class, I was, that was uh, very interesting. Could you go further if you thought about this? Uh, because of Luke 3.38, when it does the genealogy, mm -hmm. it ends with the son of Adam, the son of God. And therefore, it begs the question, um, is sons of God those that were hand-created by God? Angels, handmade by God directly, Adam, and then us as born-again believers. Yeah, let me address that before the next question so I don't lose track of them. Okay, um, yeah. the, In the Greek, there it doesn't actually say, there's, there's no son of in each of those words, each right. of those, it, it is the very first time, the son of, um, you know, when Jesus is the son of, and then it, then it just says of, 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 all the way down to of Adam, of God. Um, so it's implied. Um, but I, that's a common idea that, that son of means somebody who was specifically created by or, you know, that, that he was one of the first ones. I don't think that's the best way to address why the, why angelic beings could be called sons of God. I, okay. I think, I think, the idea that they're members of a class of Elohim makes a lot better sense than just, well, they were created directly by God. So. No, that's helpful. But second, fair question. Yep. Uh, second one, uh, in looking at this, it seems, and maybe you've done the research to confirm this, it seemed like all the Raphim could trace them all the way back to Ham and because uh, they're there both uh, genealogically but also geographically. Have you been able to confirm that? Um, if... <laughs> I have a section on this as well about um, Nimrod because it says that he began to be a mighty one on the earth, a gibor on the earth. The Septuagint actually uses the term gigas there, a giant. He was the first to be a giant on the earth again after the flood. And if, um, if he was a descendant of Canaan, then I would really jump on board with that, but he's the, uh, the son of Cush. Well, sort of. It's really weird. It says the sons of Cush were this, this. It names like five of them, but then it says Nimrod was the son of... It says it's something different about Nimrod, almost as if he's somehow differently related to Kush. It's a little strange about Nimrod. Um, but as far as all of them going back to, to him, um, yeah, most of them are in the land of Canaan. What actually seems to be happening, and, and I trace this out in the book as well, the, if you think of the city of Hebron, and in fact I, I have a, um, right here, if I had more time, I would, Abram lives in Hebron, okay, he lives by the, the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and then um, each of his descendants, that's where, um, you know, that's where Sarah's going to be buried, uh, it's, it's called it Kirjath Arba, or Kiryath Arba. Um, Arba is the father of the Anakim. Um, and uh, so each time we read about uh, this place, it always tells us extra about it, uh, which is uh, Hebron. And over and over again we read that that's where Isaac was when God made that promise, where, where Abraham was when God made the promise, your, your descendants are going to go down to a land that's not their own to be slaves for 400 years. They're going to come back here. Okay, He's in Hebron when that promise is made. Where do the spies see the giants in the land? Hebron. It's almost as if Satan's saying, oh, I'm not going to let you get back in here. I heard that promise to, to Abraham and I'm going to stop that from happening. So when you come back from, from slavery, you're not getting in. And actually that's where uh, Joseph was as well. He went up out of the Valley of Hebron. That's where he would, his bones were brought back to. Um, so it's, it almost seems like there, there's a spiritual battle where, where Satan's trying to prevent God from making good on his promise. And God says, uh, no, you're not going to stop me. In fact, if you think about the Amorites, the, the Pentateuch never describes them as giants. Joshua doesn't describe, describe them as giants. They're described as giants all the way back in Amos, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And God says, I'm the one who destroyed the Amorites from before you. When? Well, it was in Joshua's long day when God rained hailstones that, you know, down on them. More people were killed by the hailstones, more of the Amorites, who were giants, were killed by the hailstones than by the Israelites because God is wiping them out as well. So do you see a distinction between the Raphaim? I think uh, Raphaim, I think, is probably more of a generic term for giant. 
So Og was the last with the Rephaim. I've got more details about him. If, um, real quickly, if you guys, uh, this is a good example. You can see me. I'm si about six foot nine, uh, almost 250 pounds after all of the eating I've been doing this week. Uh, thankfully, I've been under that for a little while. But if Og were 13 six, which is what some people think because that's how long his bed was, that's exactly twice my height. Okay. If you want to think that he was actually that big, if he were built to my proportions, he would weigh 2,000 pounds. You don't just double my weight. You have to multiply it by eight. You have to double this way, double this way, and double this way. It's very hard to imagine the human body being able to support that sort of weight, not so much just standing there, because the compressive strength of bone is pretty good, but once you're walking and moving and twisting, it's very difficult to imagine people being quite that large. I don't think he was as tall as his bed was, but when you look at um, Goliath and you look at people in that nine foot range and some of the other ancient records we have being in somewhere in that eight to 10 foot range, I think that's reasonable, but not super high. So I think Rephaim was a general term for giant and certain people are called Rephaim, but um, Nephilim was the, the specific term for giant. Thank you very much.